and we disobey him, there are consequences to be born. And so when I get to difficulty in life and it's not convenient to keep these principles, it will not be so easy to cast aside. I will say, the principle is from God. And if I disobey this, I'm going to offend God and his nature and what he is. And there's the absolute necessity in what he is that I go to hell. Now, when I've got a problem in life and I understand that, I can say, hell is a lot worse than this. And offending God is a lot worse than this. I think I will keep it. And so it's not enough for me to stand up here and say things that make sense. It's got to be rooted in something. And so we're going to deal with the roots, first of all. And I want us to begin in Romans, the 12th chapter, verses 1 and 2. With the observation that what the world is like affects the people of God. What the world is like affects the church. Should it? No, it should not. Should we live above that and be different? Yes. But does it sometimes occur that elements of the world find their ways into and among the people of God? Yes, it does. And so the Apostle Paul says this in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice. What God expects of us is no longer sacrifices of animals where we thus remember our sins and we recall that a sacrifice is necessary and sin brings death. Jesus has done all that for us. He has become our sacrifice. He has atoned for our sins. Now my response is not to say, well, thank you, Lord, that's really great, and go about living life however I want to and making everything just as convenient for myself as I possibly can. The Lord says, look, this whole system is rooted in sacrifice. And I am calling upon you for sacrifice. I want nothing less than your life. And in order for you to give me your life, your body must be given as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service. That's reasonable, he says. And be not fashioned according to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's going to be an important expression in a moment. The renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Where the text says be not fashioned, the word fashioned means to give the same figure, to give the same appearance, to conform to the world. Sometimes that's done a very practical way. When people affect the attire of immoral, debased, defiled rock musicians, a Christian has no business trying to even look like that. We do say something about how we dress. You've got to have any more the right kind of shorts to jog in. I mean, you dare not have bicycling shorts to jog in. They've got to be jogging shorts. If you're going to ride a bicycle, you, you can't do that in blue jeans anymore. It's got to be spandex pants. And you've got to have the right kind of helmet. You're saying something by what you wear. And you say what you identify with. And the principles of life you identify with by what you wear. You are presenting yourself to the world. And the world takes notice. And the world gets an idea about you from your time, from your dress. And so even when it comes to such temporal, ephemeral things as apparel. The Christian should not be identified with the baser elements of life in the way he dresses himself. But the passage is speaking of far more than just physical attire when it tells us not to give the same figure or appearance or not to conform to the world. But remember our first thought this morning was that it is easy for what the world is to affect Christians and what the church is. Well, there are reasons for that. 
Some had just recently left the world and they are still struggling loose from the world and things in the world will still be tugging at them. And there is just the temptation for all of us to be like that which is around us. Nobody likes to stick out like a sore thumb. Nobody likes to appear different. But there are people who manage to do that. And Christians can and ought to manage to do that. Why are we so affected by the world? Well, I guess all ages have always been. Maybe there's a special reason today. And it's because we even get a distorted view of what the world is like. Somehow or another, people begin to think this last election may say, you know, our country may not be like television has been portraying it all this time. People have been aroused and they're saying, look, we've got some basic principles that have been being ignored for all these years. And we have just become aware that we're not the only ones and they have expressed themselves accordingly. But why were we deceived all of that time? Because there was an elite who had access to the dissemination of their views, not in a broad way that could be examined, but in 20 second and 30 second sound bites on the news. And a story comes on and it's represented that shortly. I mean, they might do a thorough investigation and spend two or three minutes on it. And they convey their thinking and they say a thing in a clever way and people get the idea, I better not disagree with that. And I really feel that has happened over the past 30 years. Do you know among the 20 industrialized nations of the world or 20 advanced, most advanced nations of the world, the United States is 19th in the percentage of people who take a newspaper. And I'm not saying the newspaper is always infallible. But at least you will have more time to digest and reflect upon the information there. And I know I have seen headlines in, in news stories that seem to say one thing. If you just look at the headline, you're misled and you read the article and the article actually says something different than the headline said. I've seen that happen a number of times. But at least that way you are looking at information, you are able to digest it, maybe to get a different view. And if you read enough, you might get an entirely different view. Whereas on television, you're not. You're getting basically one view on television. And I'll tell you, it's not been a good view. And all you have to do is look at the sitcoms and all the other things that television presents to see the view of those who are responsible for providing us with television today. Well, no wonder then it has been seemingly especially strong for Christians to be influenced by the currents that are around them because they're getting 20 and 30 second sound bites from television, which is monolithic in its nature, all from one point of view. If somebody else happens to be interviewed, there's the raising of the eyebrows, there's the smirk, and there's all the other things to offset that. Well, this is just taking too much time with all this. You recognize what I'm saying. You're aware of what I'm saying. But that helps us to be influenced by what is out there. And we decide that's the way we have to be. On the other hand, be not fashioned according to this world. Let us give our bodies as living sacrifices to the Lord. And that is completely at odds with this situation. The person is saying, you know, I've, I've tried to do my best and I've tried to think of other people and I've I'm, I'm, I'm really having a tough time with the circumstances of life now. And someone will say, well, you know, you've got to think of yourself in here. Maybe they will say, you've got to think of yourself first. Wrong. The basic truth of the universe is you think of others. Because God did. God does. And Jesus does. And if Jesus had not thought of us and put us first, he never would have left heaven. He would be ensconced there now, shaking his head at what is here, or more likely saying, that's it, and have blasted this whole thing out of existence. But he thought of us and acted on our behalf. And we simply violate one of the principles of the universe when we begin to take this idea, well, I've got to think of myself. If you really want to think of yourself, 
Start thinking of others. And start thinking of the great principles of life that have come from God. And think of God. Then you are helping yourself. But to try to take that shortcut and always think of what is the handiest and what is best for me and forget what it's going to do to others. And I've got to think of myself. I am violating the nature of God in that. And it will not be without consequences. And thus I turn over to Philippians, the second chapter, verses 4 and 5, where the text says, don't think of your own things, but also of the things of others. And the principle is that, yes, you've got to consider your life. You've got to consider your responsibilities and the consequences of your actions and what is good. But the sense there is don't think only of yourself. You've got to think of others. Have this mind in you which was also in Christ Jesus. And then it goes ahead to talk about his not clinging to his Godhead but coming to this earth. Taking upon himself the form of a servant. Subjecting himself unto obedience even to death on the cross. And God highly exalted him. And the text began saying, have this mind in you. But you see, if I am going to take the advice of the world that constantly says to me, you've got to think of yourself, then I'm going to begin to be like this world and to accept its principles and its way of doing things. On the other hand, the Apostle Paul says, in Romans, the 12th chapter, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Not just the renewing of how you feel, but the renewing of your mind. There is so much criticism today against head religion. What's it sound like to you? The renewing of your mind, the text says. It sounds like there's some mental activity required in being a Christian, and there certainly is in that text. It is not enough to be moved by the greatness and majesty of God or by the shepherding love of Jesus Christ and say, I feel good. There's got to be more than just an appreciation for those things. Let those things move you on to your responsibility and to the renewing of the mind that is mentioned here. In Acts 3 and verse 19, the command is, repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that there may come seasons of refreshing from the presence of the Lord. That word repent means change the mind. That's what repent means. So change the mind and turn again that your sins be blotted out. Change the mind. What does that sound like? That sounds like, be not fashioned according to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of the mind. So we have then the responsibility to repent and thus renew the mind and have the mind of Jesus Christ. And that will distinguish us in our speech, in our actions, in our ambitions, in our aims in life, in such a thing as our attire that we mentioned just a moment ago, we will be different in this world. Nevertheless, even though the Bible says this and Christians know this, as we look at a congregation, the congregation at Laodicea, in fact, all of those seven churches of Asia, most of them were like the city where they were. The Laodiceans we're like Laodicea. Before the apostle wrote this to Laodicea, there had been an earthquake. And uh, being a provincial capital of Rome, they had the right to funds from Rome to rebuild. You know what they said? We have everything we need. We don't need that, thank you. We are self-sufficient. We'll do it for ourselves. They were that prosperous and that wealthy. It's kind of like the Japanese right now. We offered help, others offered help to Japan. They said, no thanks, we don't need it in their pride. It is really good and, and well to be self-sufficient, but when it comes to the point of pride and we deceive ourselves and think that we have no need at all, we are in a dangerous circumstance. But do you remember Laodicea, the earthquake, and they said, no thanks Rome, keep your money, we don't need it. Turn to Revelation, the third chapter. And see what the Apostle John says 
or Christ through the Apostle John says to the church at Laodicea in verse 17. Revelation 3, 17. Because thou sayest I am rich and have gotten riches and have need of nothing. And you don't know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Spiritually, this is your condition. All you are looking at is your physical condition and you think that everything is well with you. Because you are prospering, you think God is providing for you spiritually. He has provided it, but you think you are acquiring the blessings of what God has acquired or granted to you, and you think his approval is upon you, and nothing could be further from the truth. You are prospering, you are materially blessed, and you are bereft of God, and he is so sick of you, he is almost ready to vomit you out, is the language the text goes ahead to say and to speak. But the point is, the church at Laodicea was a lot like the city of Laodicea. And all too often, churches in the world today are too much like the culture that they are in. And that's one of the things I want us to underline as we go on with our discussion today. And thus there is the warning in James, the fourth chapter, and verse 4. Ye adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God, and whosoever would make himself a friend of God, or maketh himself an, a friend of the world, maketh himself an enemy of God. When it's talking about adulteresses there, it is used in a spiritual sense. You've not kept your marriage vow to God. And if you're going to be a friend of the world in accepting the world's ways, you simply make yourself an enemy of God. But even with warnings like that, we go to 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, and verse 10, and find Paul speaking of Demas, a fellow worker. He had mentioned him in Colossae. He had, in addressing that epistle to Colossae, said, Demas also salutes you. But now, as Paul is in prison, the text says, Demas hath forsook me, having loved this present work. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Give your bodies a living sacrifice. Don't try to make friends with the bad elements of the world and the tawdry elements of the world. You'll make yourself an enemy of God. But it didn't keep Demas from doing that very thing. He did it. And people do that still today. Now, I'm really, with all of that, ready to get to my subject today. We've seen that I must not be selfish. I must not put myself or what I think are my self-interests, my selfish self-interests first in every decision in life. That it is my responsibility to change my way of thinking and to give my life and my body as a sacrifice to the Lord and he will not be pleased with anything less. And to do differently is going to involve me in disobedience and the loss of eternal life and the existence and the agony of an eternal hell. Now, with that understood, my subject has to do with the permanence of the marriage bond. Word just comes to me over and over again that among disciples of Christ, among those who claim to be Christians, among churches of the Lord, marriages are under great stress. Marriages are breaking up. And that is sin. And involved in that over and over again is selfishness. I can't take it any longer. This is not what I thought it would be. I've got to get in touch with my feelings. I've got to think of myself. I'm getting out of this which is making me so uncomfortable at the time. Oh, what a mistake. That most often is to turn from something you can work on and solve or improve to circumstances you will never be able to change again will complicate your life. And if you have children, it will complicate your relationship with them and their lives till the day you die. It's a terrible mistake. 
And if it is done out of selfishness and self-interest, and if the marriage is brought to an end, apart from what God has said about bringing the marriage to an end, it is sin, and the person who does it just going to hell. Lost. Terrible mistake. And one he may never be able to rectify. He may repent. He may come back to the Lord. But it may be too late ever to put his marriage back together again. I said my subject is the permanence of the marriage bond. If you look at the word marriage in the Bible, really it is talking about the living together relationship of people who are bound together as husband and wife. But what we're going to find is that this bond is in existence even though a person may be in a marriage, a living relationship with someone else. Now we use the word marriage often to speak of this bond of husband and wife, and properly so. But sometimes in the Bible there is a distinction, and I'd like us to note that distinction in our discussion. But as far as the marriage bond is concerned, turn with me to Romans, the seventh chapter, where the basic overall law is given. It's really given to illustrate something else. But here's the law Romans 7, verse 2. For the woman that hath a husband is bound by the law to the husband, or one text says the law of the husband, the law of the marriage relationship is the idea. While he lives. And the same thing is true of the husband. He's bound to his wife while she lives. But if the husband die, or if the wife die, she is discharged from the law concerning the husband or of the husband. So then, if while the husband liveth, she be joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. And why is she an adulteress? Because her husband lives. This bond is still intact, and she, in this relationship with another man being joined to him, makes herself an adulteress. She is an adulteress because she has this husband, and she is living in a sexual relationship with someone who is not her husband. Call it marriage, if you will, and the Bible will in an instant, in just a moment. But if the husband dies, she is free from the law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be joined to another man. Once a couple are married, they are joined for life. And if they take a relationship with anybody else sexually or they are married to someone else, it is adultery because in God's eyes they are still bound as husband and wife this first relationship. That's the law. There's one exception to that. In Matthew the 19th chapter and verse 9, if a man put away his wife and marry another except for fornication, he commits adultery. The idea in that passage is God does allow a mate who has uh, an adulterous mate to put that mate away and remarry. That is the only other way that marriage can be dissolved acceptably before God other than death. And that is marriage lasts until one of the partners dies or one of the partners puts away the other partner because that partner has committed fornication, has been an adulterer or an adulteress. Otherwise, we go back to Matthew, the 19th chapter, and verse 6, where it says, Let a man leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. God holds that relationship together even when men put it asunder. Let's look at a couple of passages along that line. Turn to 1 Corinthians, the 7th chapter, verse 10. This word translated put asunder, which is condemned, that word is used in this text. It is translated different, but we will differently, but we will take a look at it. Let's start with verse 10. Yes. But unto the married I give charge, yea, not I, but the Lord, that the wife depart not from her husband. 
The word there, depart, is the same word that is translated put asunder in Matthew 19, verse 6, where what God therefore hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Now it says that the wife should not depart from her husband. It says the wife depart, put asunder. And actually it's in the passive tense. It literally says if the wife be asunder. And it may be that the husband has simply pushed her out of his life. It may be she has walked out. But even though he has pushed her out of his life, even though she has walked out, if she is asundered, what do you do about that? But unto the married I give charge, yea, not I, but the Lord, that the wife depart not or be not asundered from her husband. But should she depart, should she be asundered, let her remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. The marriage is asundered. They're not living together in that union any longer. And she is, if that's the case, if he has pushed her out of his life and closed the door, they are still husband and wife. It, the marriage relationship may have been asundered, but he is still her husband. Now, if he commits fornication, if he becomes an adulterer, then she may put him away and then she may remarry. But as long as there is just some reason a couple can't get along and they decide to separate and go their way, they are still husband and wife till one dies or one puts the other one away for fornication. There's another example of that over in Mark, the sixth chapter. Mark, chapter six. The Greeks said that this marriage bond is a henesis. Now, that's not a word we're familiar with, but we can use the word and we can give to it this meaning that it has. And it is a being tied together. And I don't care what a couple do, does or what they do or how adulterous they may be or how many different people they may live with or how many marriages they may contract. Once they have been married, that henesis, that tie, that bond is there until one dies or one puts the other away from fornication. And there's going to be sin there if it is Asundered. Someone is going to sin in asundering this relationship that God has bound together. Now, in Mark, the sixth chapter, verses 17 and 18, that this has to do with John the Baptist and his preaching about Herodias and Herod. And what is wrong with their relationship? Well, start with verse 18. For John said unto Herod, It is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. And Herodias set herself against him. And I think I want to back up to verse 17. For Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold upon John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother, Philip's wife, for he had married her. He's married to Herodias. But it's not lawful for him to be married to Herodias because she is Philip, his brother's wife. And so you may be married to someone else, but that's not your husband or your wife. Here's your husband and your wife over here. So you see this term marriage is used of the living together relationship of those who are bound together as husband and wife. And even though you may bring the marriage to an end, you may be married to someone else. This relationship of husband and wife still exists over here. The henesis, to use that word, is still intact. Uh, what thought one ought to give before entering into marriage and how serious it ought to be. We are affected by our day and age because a marriage is something you put on take off like a shoe. And there are analogies to that, and you've probably heard it. And it doesn't fit. Marriage is not something you put on and take off as a shoe when it begins to pinch the toe or to be uncomfortable. Marriage is something that is not to be Asundered. It is not to be put asunder, and it is not put asunder without sin on somebody's part unless one of the mates dies. But marriage is a throwaway thing. You try it off, it doesn't work, put that one away, get another marriage. That's the way the world is today. Shouldn't we be surprised if that doesn't begin to affect people who claim 
to be Christians and take marriage more lightly than God does, to express how the world ignores it uh, in this house hunting. I've eaten more McDonald's, hamburgers, and Burger King Whoppers than I ever want to see again in my life. But sitting around in Burger King one evening, four tables of mothers and children looked out at the drive-in window and a mother and a baby. Now, I don't start telling, well, you know, the husband might be someplace. Yes, of course, one or two of the husbands might have been someplace else, but don't tell me all of them were. And everybody well knows in what people think about marriage today and the breakup of marriage that that is a reflection of what is going on in our culture. There are mothers left with children and the husband is somewhere else and the marriage no longer exists. That's terrible, terribly sad. Is that the easy way out? To go out to Burger King and eat every night? I don't know if it's every night. That's sort of not a pleasant way out. I'll tell you. I hate to look forward to that the rest of my life. I can't stand this husband any longer. Therefore, I'll keep the kids, take all the responsibility of the kids, knock myself out working all day long, come home tired, and we'll go out and sit lonely at a Burger King table and eat hamburgers night after night. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that a solution to the problem? But that's the solution in the world today. And that's only the very small part of it. That's a very, very minor problem that results from divorce. And there are a lot of things that have contributed to all of that. What? What causes this? What causes marriage? Oh, there have always been money problems that have put pressures on marriages and caused contentiousness and maybe have caused people to break up. There have always been sexual tensions that have created problems in life. Today that's really aggravated because if there are sexual tensions in the marriage, there usually is somebody else that one of the partners who is dissatisfied can turn to rather easily, sadly today and that's putting a burden on marriage and causing marriages also to break up but why not why so many marriages breaking up so easily well it's because we strayed from God it's because we're not concerned with his standards of right and wrong it's because of selfishness that we talked about earlier in the lesson and it's not that we just have stern husbands that really do not accommodate their wives and treat them with respect and regard and nourish them and cherish them as the Bible says but I mean, there are physically abusive husbands out there today that are cruel. I mean, who physically beat their wives. And there is this admixture of men and women professionally and socially, where the husband sees his wife in the morning and she's not dressed yet, maybe still in her hair curlers, if that's what's done, or in the blow dryer, and there it is. And then he goes to the office and here are all these people who got through with that process a little bit earlier standing there in all of their glamour and dressed and all this supposedly important stuff of shuffling papers around all day long and all these world momentous affairs that are so important. Or at least we make them that important to our existence. There's glamour there. And if you don't think that's going to cause problems, then you just don't understand men and women. And don't tell how sexist that is. Well, I'll tell you, sex is a basic element of life. And you're not going to eradicate it. And it's going to be there. And unless there are certain standards of behavior for men and women, immorality is going to be prevalent and marriages are going to break up. It's just going to occur. And a Christian had better have his standards already settled and know what is important to him and be ready to resist temptation. And then there is just irresponsibility of men are not bound by responsibility today. They didn't have to support the family anymore. They marry expecting that the wife's going to help make the house payment. I mean, we, we build a bigger house than we can afford because we're both going to work. And, and what is life? It is knocking oneself out day by day, not having time for one another, not having time for the children, not having time for spiritual things, not having time for the Lord, but out in a glamorous job if it's glamorous, both out there. And 
The house is not a nice, pleasant place to live. It is something we're supporting. We're taking care of the house. We're serving the house and paying for that. We're paying for the car. We're paying for this. We're paying for that. And our children are growing up with babysitters. And we feed them Burger Kings. And we put them to bed at night. And we have no time to spend with them. We don't have time to read to them. We don't have time to impart to them the principles we were taught, which we have forgotten and put out of our lives. And they'll never learn those because they're going to school to infidel teachers, members of the NEA, with its corrupt standards which have brought on, has brought on a lot of dissatisfaction with education today. And that, it, that dissatisfaction rightly belongs there. And that's who is going to tell your child what to think. And that's what your child is going to think. Because you're taking care of a house. And you're taking care of all these other glamorous things in life. Christian is going to have to think differently than the rest of the world thinks. The things that are important to him and valuable to him are going to be, have to be different from what is important to the rest of the world. But I'm back to men don't even have the responsibility of supporting the family any longer. Isn't that wonderful? We've got equality. No, you just have a blurring of roles. You don't have equality. I believe in equality. Men and women equally are important before God. They have specific and different roles that they can play in things that they can contribute to in life and a woman ought to learn what a woman is and contribute that to life and a man ought to learn what a man is and contribute that to life but we don't have that today and men, if man wants to walk out of marriage fine leave the children with the wife or he may love the children may go through the process of sometime fighting for his children sometime husbands have why don't you see keeping the marriage together and stay there and have a husband and wife and mother and daddy for those children and not act selfishly just because things are painful at this particular time. And not only that, even before marriage, men don't have responsibilities. They can just beget children and walk away. They can beget children by any number of women and any number of women can have many children by many different fathers. And what happens? Our culture is coming apart. Do you know that in Chicago, now sometimes people associate these figures with blacks. This is not just blacks. And a person is deceived if he thinks that. I know in some elements their statistics are worse than, than others. But in Chicago, this is the totality in Chicago. 80% of first births are illegitimate births in Chicago, Illinois. What in the world does that portend for the future? I've got two over here. I don't know what that is. <laughs> Victory sign, maybe. <laughs> but that's trouble for the future. And nobody has any right to look askance at everybody else. What we've got to do is get the gospel of Jesus Christ out there and convert every soul we can and begin to teach the things that are right and true to everyone. And that's not being done because there are other forces among us that are getting their message out there. The television sitcoms are getting their message out there. But I'm still having trouble getting to the point that I want to. In that situation, you know who has the power to stop that tomorrow? Let me tell you this. New Jersey passed the law. You have one child, it, you can receive aid to dependent children. You have a second child out of wedlock, you don't get help. In two years, you know what has happened to the illegitimacy rate in New Jersey? It has fallen 10%. What's happened? The women are taking a little bit of control and saying, hey, I'm not going to get any money for this. We're not doing this. That's what's happening. What's that tell you? That tells you, now women may think this is unfair, but what it is, it says women have the power. They say, marry me or no sex, period. You think men are going to run, run around and be celibate the rest of their lives? Would you like to buy the Brooklyn Bridge? What do you think men are going to do? They're going to marry them. And they're going to take that responsibility. Oh, but we want equality. Wonderful. You've got equality. The mother's left with the children trying to rear them. Drawing welfare, trying to work and support them with all the struggle that that is. Isn't that wonderful? Equality. Women, in this thing, you don't have equality. You have the ability to determine 
that men are responsible, that they will support you, they will care for you and take care of the children. You can establish that standard simply by saying what God has ordained anyhow. No sex until marriage. That's where God put it. It has a purpose there. It has a function there. It is beneficial there. And that's where it's going to be. And it's not going to be anywhere else. And I mean overnight this culture is turned around. But are we going to do that? No, oh, the world's not going to do that, and we must not be affected by it. There's all this feminist propaganda that is out there. But let me tell you this, people. Do you remember the name Betty Friedan early in this movement? She said, we made mistakes. In our goals and aims, we left out the housewife and what is important to her, and they have turned against us. She's right about that. Not only housewives have turned against the feminist movement, many women have turned against the feminist movement today. Well, why? Well, maybe it's because of Gloria Steinem, who admits the position she has taken. Her principles now have led her into an insecure, lonely life. Yeah, you two principal early feminists. Do I have to say this? Those of you who've heard me preach, I think, understand that I don't have a chip on my shoulder in regard to women. If, if you don't know that and don't believe that, then just forget me and think about what I'm saying so that I don't have to make all these apologies saying I'm not a sexist, I'm not a sexist, I'm not a sexist. But we're studying things and principles from the Word of God and what is being out there in the world today is simply contrary to it. How is it that people enter marriage? Well, I don't know. Is, is this the good old days thing? I, growing up, I remember seeing guys so smitten. I mean, they became tongue-tied. They turned red in the face. They were embarrassed. They were awkward. I mean, this, this girl just, I mean, slew them. And if she didn't respond or if she did for a while, he thinks, oh, I wonder she's mine. I just, I cannot live without this girl. And she says, Yes, you will. I'm going with somebody else. Then he really feels, I mean, ready to die. Did you ever go through that? I started to say, you missed something if you didn't. <laughs> but I don't know. Well, the other part of it was pretty good. Does that still happen? Or has romance been so destroyed that it's all a really very practical thing? Everybody's got to have a boyfriend. Everybody's got to go steady. I've got to have a boyfriend. You'll do. <laughs> that way I'm socially acceptable now I'm not one of these people out here by myself I've got to have someone so I've got somebody and so we get married Marlene is reading Far From the Madding Crowd which Allison lent to her I hope this is a good book or Allison and Marlene could be in trouble <laughs> but it's, it's about a man you know, when I read something, I don't bother to talk about it. It's, it's like some character on WABC who has a morning show. He says, Rush taught me everything he knows, but he didn't teach me everything he knows. And it, it's kind of like this, that uh, I don't teach Marlene everything I know because I don't talk that much. But she, bless her heart, when she learns something or she reads something, she shares it with me and she tells me. So I benefit by my reading, I benefit by her reading too. And... There is this character who sees this young girl, Bathsheba, and rather than whistling and singing, the sweetest thing he can do is say her name, just go on, Bathsheba, Bathsheba. I mean, he is smitten. And he contrives reasons to see her, and he sees her, and in his ineptness, he blurts out that he wants her to marry him. And I mean, there's been nothing hardly but just visually seeing him occasionally. If that, well, that's, that's romantic. It may not be very effective, but girls and boys used to feel that way for one another. Do they still do that? But you know, if you enter into marriage with that, what you've got to understand is there are some biological uh, and hormonal reasons for all of that, and all that's going to settle down. In the meantime, you're going to have to build something that is greater and richer and more significant than that. 
And it can be done, and more rewarding, actually, in the long run. But it's a nice way to begin. So some people, I suppose, just begin on a practical note. But can that lead to successful marriage? I say it can. There are countries where the bride and groom never meet till the marriage day. And yet, they grow close to one another and love one another enduringly through that. Well, how come it didn't start romantically? Well, because there are solid, basic principles that they have both accepted and they're committed to, and it brings shame upon them, it brings shame upon their families, and they will not break those principles. And they know they've got to make the best of the marriage, and they do. We don't have that in our culture. If marriage isn't easy, we walk out of it. On the other hand, if there is romance, then as soon as the hormones begin to settle down, and something richer ought to, be, ought to come in there, and something more responsible ought to be there, then we think, oh, the marriage is over. Where's the fire? Where's the flame? Where are the fireworks? It's not there, so we must not love each other anymore. We might as well go our separate ways. What a terrible mistake, and yet that's done. I'm afraid Christians sometimes are affected by all of that. And then, oh, here is, here is this quotation I was going to read to you. I know I'm going along this morning, but folks, this is really impossible. If, you, if you've got to leave, go ahead. I won't be mad at you because some of you may really have to leave because you've got schedules. I'm going to take just a, a few moments longer, but I'm, I haven't preached a long sermon on Sunday morning in a long time. And I've just got till March to be with you. So, But after that, you won't have to worry about it anymore. From Far From the Madding Crowd by Thomas Hardy. Love is a possible strength in an actual weakness. When a young man is smitten of a woman, it's a possible strength, but I mean, it's a weakness to go around blushing and bumbling and stumbling over your tongue and aching your heart and just dissatisfied all the time you're not with her. Marriage transforms a distraction, and that is a distraction, into a support. Marriage transforms a distraction into a support, the power of which should be, and hopefully often is, in direct proportion to the degree of imbecility it supplants. Well, you can see the imbecility of here, out here and the mistakes that you make. Marriage transforms all of that.